Sappho, Aeolic Greek Sappho Sappho, c. 630 c. 570 BC was an archaic Greek poet from the island of Lesbos. Sappho is known for her lyric poetry, written to be sung while accompanied by a lyre. Most of Sappho's poetry is now lost, and what is extant has survived only in fragmentary form, except for one complete poem, the Ode to Aphrodite. As well as lyric poetry, ancient commentators claimed that Sappho wrote elegiac and iambic poetry. Three epigrams attributed to Sappho are extant, but these are actually Hellenistic imitations of Sappho's style. Little is known of Sappho's life. She was from a wealthy family from Lesbos, though the names of both of her parents are uncertain. Ancient sources say that she had three brothers, the names of two of them are mentioned in the brothers' poem discovered in 2014. She was exiled to Sicily around 600 BC, and may have continued to work until around 570. Later legends surrounding Sappho's love for the ferryman Phaeon and her death are unreliable. Sappho was a prolific poet, probably composing around 10,000 lines. Her poetry was well known and greatly admired through much of antiquity, and she was among the canon of nine lyric poets most highly esteemed by scholars of Hellenistic Alexandria. Sappho's poetry is still considered extraordinary and her works continue to influence other writers. Beyond her poetry, she is well known as a symbol of love and desire between women. <laughs> Ancient sources There are three sources of information about Sappho's life, her testimonia, the history of her times, and what can be gleaned from her own poetry although scholars are cautious when reading poetry as a biographical source. Testimonia is a term of art in ancient studies that refers to collections of classical biographical and literary references to classical authors. The testimonia regarding Sappho do not contain references contemporary to Sappho. The representations of Sappho's life that occur in the testimonia, always need to be assessed for accuracy, many of them are certainly not correct. The testimonia are also a source of knowledge regarding how Sappho's poetry was received in antiquity. Some details mentioned in the testimonia are derived from Sappho's own poetry, which is of great interest, especially considering the testimonia originate from a time when more of Sappho's poetry was extant than is the case for modern readers. <laughs> Life Little is known about Sappho's life for certain. She was from Mytilene on the island of Lesbos and was probably born around 630 BC. Tradition names her mother as Cleis, though ancient scholars may simply have guessed this name, assuming that Sappho's daughter Cleis was named after her. Sappho's father's name is less certain. Ten names are known for Sappho's father from the ancient testimonia. This proliferation of possible names suggests that he was not explicitly named in any of Sappho's poetry. The earliest and most commonly attested name for Sappho's father is Scamandronymus. In Ovid's Heroides, Sappho's father died when she was seven. Sappho's father is not mentioned in any of her surviving works, but Campbell suggests that this detail may have been based on a now lost poem. Sappho's own name is found in numerous variant spellings, even in her own Aeolian dialect. The form that appears in her own extant poetry is Sappho. No reliable portrait of Sappho's physical appearance has survived. All extant representations, ancient and modern, are artists' conceptions. In the Tithonus poem, she describes her hair as now white but formerly melena, i.e., black. A literary papyrus of the 2nd century AD describes her as pantalos micra, quite tiny. Alcius possibly describes Sappho as violet-haired, which was a common Greek poetic way of describing dark hair. Some scholars dismiss this tradition as unreliable. Sappho was said to have three brothers, Eregius, Laricus, and Charaxus. According to Athenius, Sappho often praised Laricus for pouring wine in the town hall of Mytilene, an office held by boys of the best families. This indication that Sappho was born into an aristocratic family is consistent with the sometimes rarefied environments that her verses record. One ancient tradition tells of a relation between Charaxus and the Egyptian courtesan Rhodopis. Herodotus, the oldest source of the story, reports that Charaxus ransomed Rhodopis for a large sum and that Sappho wrote a poem rebuking him for this. Sappho may have had a daughter named Cleis, who is referred to in two fragments. Not all scholars accept that Cleis was Sappho's daughter. Fragment 132 describes Cleis as pays, pays, which, as well as meaning child, can also refer to the 
youthful beloved in a male homosexual liaison. It has been suggested that Cleese was one of Sappho's younger lovers, rather than her daughter, though Judith Hallett argues that the language used in Fragment 132 suggests that Sappho was referring to Cleese as her daughter. According to the Suda, Sappho was married to Kirkilas of Andros. However, the name appears to have been invented by a comic poet. The name, Kirkilas, comes from the word, Kerkos, Kirkos, a possible meaning of which is, penis, and is not otherwise attested as a name, while Andros, as well as being the name of a Greek island, is a form of the Greek word, aner, aner, which means man. Thus, the name may be a joke name, and as such could be rendered as, Dick Alcock from the Isle of Man. Sappho and her family were exiled from Lesbos to Syracuse, Sicily around 600 BC. The Parian Chronicle records Sappho going into exile some time between 604 and 591. This may have been as a result of her family's involvement with the conflicts between political elites on Lesbos in this period, the same reason for Sappho's contemporary Alcius exile from Mytilene around the same time. Later the exiles were allowed to return. A tradition going back at least to Menander fr. 258k suggested that Sappho killed herself by jumping off the Leucadian cliffs for love of Phaeon, a ferryman. This is regarded as unhistorical by modern scholars, perhaps invented by the comic poets or originating from a misreading of a first-person reference in a non-biographical poem. The legend may have resulted in part from a desire to assert Sappho as heterosexual. <laughs> Sexuality Today Sappho, for many, is a symbol of female homosexuality. The common term lesbian is an allusion to Sappho, originating from the name of the island of Lesbos, where she was born. However, she has not always been so considered. In classical Athenian comedy from the old comedy of the 5th century to Menander in the late 4th and early 3rd centuries BC, Sappho was caricatured as a promiscuous heterosexual woman, and it is not until the Hellenistic period that the first testimonia which explicitly discuss Sappho's homoeroticism are preserved. The earliest of these is a fragmentary biography written on papyrus in the late 3rd or early 2nd century BC, which states that Sappho was accused by some of being irregular in her ways and a woman lover." Dennis Page comments that the phrase, by some, implies that even the full corpus of Sappho's poetry did not provide conclusive evidence of whether she described herself as having sex with women. These ancient authors do not appear to have believed that Sappho did, in fact, have sexual relationships with other women, and as late as the 10th century the Suda records that Sappho was slanderously accused of having sexual relationships with her female pupils. Among modern scholars, Sappho's sexuality is still debated. André Lardinois has described it as the great Sappho question. Early translators of Sappho sometimes heterosexualized her poetry. Ambrose Philip's 1711 translation of the Ode to Aphrodite portrayed the object of Sappho's desire as male, a reading that was followed by virtually every other translator of the poem until the 20th century, while in 1781 Alessandro Verri interpreted Fragment 31 as being about Sappho's love for Phaeon. Friedrich Gottlieb Welker argued that Sappho's feelings for other women were "...entirely idealistic and non-sensual," while Karl Ottfried Müller wrote that Fragment 31 described nothing but a friendly affection." Glenn Most comments that, "...one wonders what language Sappho would have used to describe her feelings if they had been ones of sexual excitement." If this theory were correct. By 1970, it would be argued that the same poem contained, "...proof positive of Sappho's lesbianism." Today, it is generally accepted that Sappho's poetry portrays homoerotic feelings, as Sandra Boringer puts it, her works clearly celebrate eros between women." Toward the end of the 20th century, though, some scholars began to reject the question of whether or not Sappho was a lesbian, Glenn Most wrote that Sappho herself, "...would have had no idea what people mean when they call her nowadays a homosexual." André Lardinois stated that it is, "...nonsensical," to ask whether Sappho was a lesbian, and Page Dubois calls the question a, "...particularly obfuscating debate." One of the major focuses of scholars studying Sappho has been to attempt to determine the cultural context in which Sappho's poems were composed and performed. Various cultural contexts and social roles played by Sappho have been suggested, including teacher, cult leader, and poet performing for a circle of female friends. <laughs> 
However, the performance contexts of many of Sappho's fragments are not easy to determine, and for many more than one possible context is conceivable. One long-standing suggestion of a social role for Sappho is that of Sappho as schoolmistress. At the beginning of the 20th century, the German classicist Ulrich von Willemowitz Mollendorf posited that Sappho was a sort of schoolteacher, in order to explain away Sappho's passion for her girls and defend her from accusations of homosexuality. The view continues to be influential, both among scholars and the general public, though more recently the idea has been criticized by historians as anachronistic and has been rejected by several prominent classicists as unjustified by the evidence. In 1959, Dennis Page, for example, stated that Sappho's extant fragments portray the loves and jealousies, the pleasures and pains, of Sappho and her companions. And he adds, we have found, and shall find, no trace of any formal or official or professional relationship between them. No trace of Sappho the principal of an academy. David A. Campbell in 1967 judged that Sappho may have presided over a literary coterie, but that evidence for a formal appointment as priestess or teacher is hard to find. None of Sappho's own poetry mentions her teaching, and the earliest testimonium to support the idea of Sappho as a teacher comes from Ovid, six centuries after Sappho's lifetime. Despite these problems, many newer interpretations of Sappho's social role are still based on this idea. In these interpretations, Sappho was involved in the ritual education of girls, for instance as a trainer of choruses of girls, even if Sappho did compose songs for training choruses of young girls, not all of her poems can be interpreted in this light, and despite scholars' best attempts to find one, Yatramanilakis argues that there is no single performance context to which all of Sappho's poems can be attributed. Parker argues that Sappho should be considered as part of a group of female friends for whom she would have performed, just as her contemporary Alcius is. Some of her poetry appears to have been composed for identifiable formal occasions, but many of her songs are about, and possibly were to be performed at, banquets. Works <laughs> <laughs> Sappho probably wrote around 10,000 lines of poetry, today, only about 650 survive. She is best known for her lyric poetry, written to be accompanied by music. The Suda also attributes to Sappho epigrams, elegiacs, and iambics. Three of these epigrams are extant, but are in fact later Hellenistic poems inspired by Sappho, as are the iambic and elegiac poems attributed to her in the Suda. Ancient authors claim that Sappho primarily wrote love poetry, and the indirect transmission of Sappho's work supports this notion. However, the papyrus tradition suggests that this may not have been the case. A series of papyri published in 2014 contains fragments of ten consecutive poems from Book I of the Alexandrian edition of Sappho, of which only two are certainly love poems, while at least three and possibly four are primarily concerned with family. Topic. Ancient editions Sappho's poetry was probably first written down on Lesbos, either in her lifetime or shortly afterwards, initially probably in the form of a score for performers of Sappho's work. In the 5th century, Athenian book publishers probably began to produce copies of lesbian lyric poetry, some including explanatory material and glosses as well as the poems themselves. Some time in the 2nd or 3rd century, Alexandrian scholars produced a critical edition of Sappho's poetry. There may have been more than one Alexandrian edition, John J. Winkler argues for two, one edited by Aristophanes of Byzantium and another by his pupil Aristarchus of Samothrace. This is not certain, ancient sources tell us that Aristarchus' edition of Alcius replaced the edition by Aristophanes, but are silent on whether Sappho's work, too, went through multiple editions. The Alexandrian edition of Sappho's poetry was based on the existing Athenian collections, and was divided into at least eight books, though the exact number is uncertain. Many modern scholars have followed Dennis Page, who conjectured a ninth book in the standard edition. Yatramanilakis doubts this, noting that though testimonia refer to an eighth book of Sappho's poetry, none mention a ninth. Whatever its makeup, the Alexandrian edition of Sappho probably grouped her poems by their meter. Ancient sources tell us that each of the first three books contained poems in a single specific meter. <laughs> 
Ancient editions of Sappho, possibly starting with the Alexandrian edition, seem to have ordered the poems in at least the first book of Sappho's poetry, which contained works composed in sapphic stanzas, alphabetically. Even after the publication of the standard Alexandrian edition, Sappho's poetry continued to circulate in other poetry collections. For instance, the Cologne papyrus on which the Tithonus poem is preserved was part of a Hellenistic anthology of poetry, which contained poetry arranged by theme, rather than by meter and incipit, as it was in the Alexandrian edition. <laughs> <laughs> Surviving poetry The earliest surviving manuscripts of Sappho, including the potsherd on which Fragment II is preserved, date to the 3rd century BC, and thus predate the Alexandrian edition. The latest surviving copies of Sappho's poems transmitted directly from ancient times are written on parchment codex pages from the 6th and 7th centuries AD, and were surely reproduced from ancient papyri now lost. Manuscript copies of Sappho's works may have survived a few centuries longer, but around the 9th century her poetry appears to have disappeared, and by the 12th century, John Zetzes could write that, "...the passage of time has destroyed Sappho and her works." According to legend, Sappho's poetry was lost because the Church disapproved of her morals. These legends appear to have originated in the Renaissance. Around 1550, Jerome Cardin wrote that Gregory Nazianzen had Sappho's work publicly destroyed, and at the end of the 16th century, Joseph Justus Scaliger claimed that Sappho's works were burned in Rome and Constantinople in 1073 on the orders of Pope Gregory VII. In reality, Sappho's work was probably lost as the demand for it was insufficiently great for it to be copied onto parchment when codices superseded papyrus scrolls as the predominant form of book. Another contributing factor to the loss of Sappho's poems may have been the perceived obscurity of her Aeolic dialect, which contains many archaisms and innovations absent from other ancient Greek dialects. During the Roman period, by which time the Attic dialect had become the standard for literary compositions, many readers found Sappho's dialect difficult to understand and, in the 2nd century AD, the Roman author Apuleius specifically remarks on its strangeness. Only approximately 650 lines of Sappho's poetry still survive, of which just one poem, the Ode to Aphrodite, is complete, and more than half of the original lines survive in around ten more fragments. Many of the surviving fragments of Sappho contain only a single word, for example, fragment 169a is simply a word meaning wedding gifts, and survives as part of a dictionary of rare words. The two major sources of surviving fragments of Sappho are quotations in other ancient works, from a whole poem to as little as a single word, and fragments of papyrus, many of which were discovered at Oxyrhynchus in Egypt. Other fragments survive on other materials, including parchment and potsherds. The oldest surviving fragment of Sappho currently known is the Cologne papyrus which contains the Tithonus poem, dating to the 3rd century BC, until the last quarter of the 19th century, only the ancient quotations of Sappho survived. In 1879, the first new discovery of a fragment of Sappho was made at Fiam. By the end of the 19th century, Grenfell and Hunt had begun to excavate an ancient rubbish dump at Oxyrhynchus, leading to the discoveries of many previously unknown fragments of Sappho. Fragments of Sappho continue to be rediscovered. Most recently, major discoveries in 2004, the Tithonus poem, and a new, previously unknown fragment, and 2014, fragments of nine poems, five already known but with new readings, four, including the Brothers poem, not previously known, have been reported in the media around the world. Topic. Style Sappho clearly worked within a well-developed tradition of lesbian poetry, which had evolved its own poetic diction, meters, and conventions. Among her famous poetic forebears were Arian and Terpander. Nonetheless, her work is innovative, it is some of the earliest Greek poetry to adopt the lyric I to write poetry adopting the viewpoint of a specific person, in contrast to the earlier epic poets Homer and Hesiod, who present themselves more as conduits of divine inspiration. Her poetry explores individual identity and personal emotions, desire, jealousy, and love. It also adopts and reinterprets the existing imagery epic poetry in exploring these themes. Sappho's poetry is known for its clear language and simple thoughts, sharply drawn images, and use of direct quotation which brings a sense of immediacy. Unexpected word play is a characteristic feature of her style. An example is from fragment 96. 
Now she stands out among Lydian women as after sunset the rose fingered moon exceeds all stars. A variation of the Homeric epithet, rosy fingered dawn. Sappho's poetry often uses hyperbole, according to ancient critics, because of its charm. An example is found in Fragment 111, where Sappho writes that, the groom approaches like Ares. much bigger than a big man. Leslie Kirk groups Sappho with those archaic Greek poets from what has been called the Aelite ideological tradition, which valued luxury and high birth. These elite poets tended to identify themselves with the worlds of Greek myths, gods, and heroes, as well as the wealthy East, especially Lydia. Thus in Fragment 2 Sappho describes Aphrodite, "...pour into golden cups nectar lavishly mingled with joys," while in the Tithonus poem she explicitly states that, I love the finer things Habrosine. According to Page Dubois, the language, as well as the content, of Sappho's poetry evokes an aristocratic sphere. She contrasts Sappho's flowery, adorned style with the austere, decorous, restrained style embodied in the works of later classical authors such as Sophocles, Demosthenes, and Pindar. Traditional modern literary critics of Sappho's poetry have tended to see her poetry as a vivid and skilled but spontaneous and naive expression of emotion. Typical of this view are the remarks of H. J. Rose that, Sappho wrote as she spoke, owing practically nothing to any literary influence, and that her verse displays, the charm of absolute naturalness. Against this essentially romantic view, one school of more recent critics argues that, on the contrary, Sappho's poetry displays and depends for its effect on a sophisticated deployment of the strategies of traditional Greek rhetorical genres. Legacy Ancient reputation In antiquity Sappho's poetry was highly admired, and several ancient sources refer to her as the Tenth Muse. The earliest surviving poem to do so is a 3rd century BC epigram by Dioscorides, but poems are preserved in the Greek anthology by Antipater of Sidon and attributed to Plato on the same theme. She was sometimes referred to as the poetess, just as Homer was the poet. The scholars of Alexandria included Sappho in the canon of nine lyric poets. According to Alien, the Athenian lawmaker and poet Solon asked to be taught a song by Sappho, so that I may learn it and then die. This story may well be apocryphal, especially as Ammianus Marcellinus tells a similar story about Socrates and a song of Stesichorus, but it is indicative of how highly Sappho's poetry was considered in the ancient world. Sappho's poetry also influenced other ancient authors. In Greek, the Hellenistic poet Nasis was described by Marilyn B. Skinner as an imitator of Sappho, and Catherine Gutzwiller argues that Nasis explicitly positioned herself as an inheritor of Sappho's position as a woman poet. Beyond poetry, Plato cites Sappho in his Phaedrus, and Socrates' second speech on love in that dialogue appears to echo Sappho's descriptions of the physical effects of desire in Fragment 31. In the 1st century BC, Catullus established the themes and meters of Sappho's poetry as a part of Latin literature, adopting the sapphic stanza, believed in antiquity to have been invented by Sappho, giving his lover in his poetry the name, Lesbia, in reference to Sappho, and adapting and translating Sappho's 31st fragment in his poem 51. Other ancient poets wrote about Sappho's life. She was a popular character in ancient Athenian comedy, and at least six separate comedies called Sappho are known. The earliest known ancient comedy to take Sappho as its main subject was the early 5th or late 4th century BC Sappho by Amepsias, though nothing is known of it apart from its name. Sappho was also a favorite subject in the visual arts, the most commonly depicted poet on 6th and 5th century Attic red figure vase paintings, and the subject of a sculpture by Solanion. From the 4th century BC, ancient works portray Sappho as a tragic heroine, driven to suicide by her unrequited love for Phaon. For instance, a fragment of a play by Menander says that Sappho threw herself off of the cliff at Lucas out of her love for Phaon. Ovid's Heroides 15 is written as a letter from Sappho to her supposed love Phaon, and when it was first rediscovered in the 15th century was thought to be a translation of an authentic letter of Sappho's. <laughs> 
Sappho's suicide was also depicted in classical art, for instance on a 1st century BC basilica in Rome near the Porta Maggiore. While Sappho's poetry was admired in the ancient world, her character was not always so well considered. In the Roman period, critics found her lustful and perhaps even homosexual. Horace called her Mascula Sappho in his epistles, which the later Porfirio commented was either because she is famous for her poetry, in which men more often excel, or because she is maligned for having been a tribad." By the 3rd century AD, the difference between Sappho's literary reputation as a poet and her moral reputation as a woman had become so significant that the suggestion that there were in fact two Sapphos began to develop. In his historical miscellanies, Alien wrote that there was "...another Sappho, a courtesan, not a poetess." Topic. Modern reception By the medieval period, Sappho's works had been lost, though she was still known through later ancient authors such as Ovid. Her works began to become accessible again in the 16th century, first in early printed editions of authors who had quoted her. In 1508 Aldus Minucius printed an edition of Dionysus of Halicarnassus, which contained Sappho I, the Ode to Aphrodite and the first printed edition of Longinus on the Sublime, complete with his quotation of Sappho 31, appeared in 1554. In 1566, the French printer Robert Estienne produced an edition of the Greek lyric poets which contained around 40 fragments attributed to Sappho. In 1652, the first English translation of a poem by Sappho was published, in John Hall's translation of On the Sublime, in 1681 Anne Lefebvre's French edition of Sappho made her work even more widely known. Theodore Burke's 1854 edition became the standard edition of Sappho in the second half of the 19th century. In the first part of the 20th, the papyrus discoveries of new poems by Sappho led to editions and translations by Edwin Marion Cox and John Maxwell Edmonds, and culminated in the 1955 publication of Edgar Lobel's and Dennis Page's Poetarum Lesbiorum Fragmenta. Like the ancients, modern critics have tended to consider Sappho's poetry extraordinary. As early as the 9th century, Sappho was referred to as a talented woman poet, and in works such as Boccaccia's De Claris Mularibus and Christine de Pizan's book of the City of Ladies she gained a reputation as a learned lady. Even after Sappho's works had been lost, the sapphic stanza continued to be used in medieval lyric poetry, and with the rediscovery of her work in the Renaissance, she began to increasingly influence European poetry. In the 16th century, members of La Pléiade, a circle of French poets, were influenced by her to experiment with sapphic stanzas and with writing love poetry with a first-person female voice. From the Romantic era, Sappho's work, especially her Ode to Aphrodite, has been a key influence of conceptions of what lyric poetry should be. Such influential poets as Alfred Lord Tennyson in the 19th century, and A. E. Houseman in the 20th, have been influenced by her poetry. Tennyson-based poems including Eleanor and Fatima on Sappho's Fragment 31, while three of Houseman's works are adaptations of the Midnight Poem, long thought to be by Sappho though the authorship is now disputed. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Imagists, especially Ezra Pound, H.D., and Richard Aldington, were influenced by Sappho's fragments. A number of Pound's poems in his early collection Lustra were adaptations of sapphic poems, while H.D.'s poetry was frequently sapphic in style, theme or content, and in some cases, such as Fragment 40, more specifically invoke Sappho's writing. It was not long after the rediscovery of Sappho that her sexuality once again became the focus of critical attention. In the early 17th century, John Donne wrote, Sappho to Felinus, returning to the idea of Sappho as a hypersexual lover of women. The modern debate on Sappho's sexuality began in the 19th century, with Welker publishing, in 1816, an article defending Sappho from charges of prostitution and lesbianism, arguing that she was chaste, a position which would later be taken up by Willemowitz at the end of the 19th and Henry Thornton Wharton at the beginning of the 20th centuries. Despite attempts to defend her good name, in the 19th century Sappho was co-opted by the decadent movement as a lesbian daughter of de Chaudet, by Charles Baudelaire in France and later Algernon Charles Swinburne in England. 
By the late 19th century, lesbian writers such as Michael Field and Amy Levy became interested in Sappho for her sexuality, and by the turn of the 20th century she was a sort of patron saint of lesbians. From the 19th century, Sappho began to be regarded as a role model for campaigners for women's rights, beginning with works such as Caroline Norton's The Picture of Sappho. Later in that century, she would become a model for the so-called new woman, independent and educated women who desired social and sexual autonomy, and by the 1960s, the feminist Sappho was, along with the hypersexual, often but not exclusively lesbian Sappho, one of the two most important cultural perceptions of Sappho. The discoveries of new poems by Sappho in 2004 and 2014 excited both scholarly and media attention. The announcement of the Tithonus poem was the subject of international news coverage, and was described by Marilyn Skinner as the Truvi of a lifetime. Topic see also Ancient Greek literature Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 7 Papyrus preserving Sappho Fr. 5 Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 1231 Papyrus preserving Sappho Frr. 15 to 30 topic notes topic references topic works cited topic further reading Bomber, Josephine 1992 Sappho Poems and Fragments Bloodaxe. Barnard, Mary 2000, Sappho, A New Translation. University of California Press. Burris, Simon, Fish, Jeffrey, Obink, Dirk 2014. New Fragments of Book 1 of Sappho. Zeitschrift für Papyrologie und Epigraphik, 189. Carson, Anne 2002. If Not, Winter, Fragments of Sappho. New York, Knopf. ISBN 0-375-41067-8. Dubin, Jeffrey M. 1983. Ancient and Modern Images of Sappho, Translations and Studies in Archaic Greek Love Lyric. University Press of America. Green, Ellen, ed. 1996. Reading Sappho. Berkeley, University of California Press. Lobel, E., Page, D. L., E. D. S., 1955. Poetarum Lesbiorum Fragmenta. Oxford, Clarendon Press. Obink, Dirk. 2014. Two New Poems by Sappho. Zeitschrift für Papyrologie und Epigraphik, 189. Powell, Jim 2007, The Poetry of Sappho Oxford University Press. Voigt, Eva Maria 1971. Sappho et Alcius. Fragmenta. Amsterdam, Polak and Van Hennep. Topic external links Commentaries on Sappho's Fragments, William Annies. Fragments of Sappho, translated by Julia Dubnoff. Tithonus Poem, Text, Translation by M. L. West, and Notes by William Harris. Brothers Poem, Translation by Tim Whitmarsh. Sappho, BBC Radio 4, In Our Time. Sappho, BBC Radio 4, Great Lives. Works by Sappho at Project Gutenberg Sappho, a poem by Letitia Elizabeth Landon, 1822. Landon uses Sappho as one of the founders of a lineage of female poets. Sappho. Wikisource. A poem by Florence Earl Coates. To Sappho Dead. Wikisource. A poem by Florence Earl Coates. S-O-R-G-L-L, -L, Sappho 1, read by Stephen G. Dates Text of Sappho's poems with translations by Sean Palmer.